I need some traction. You need some traction. Super excited for today's session because it's one of my favorite topics. I am a pirate and we've raised a lot of money and now it's time for me to graduate into a Navy Admiral. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm having an internal fight with myself and I couldn't find a better speaker than Lori Schultz here, who's taken We, we Galvanize, which was ACL, uh, what, 49, 50 year old company, I guess? 49 years. Yeah, 49 year old company that was primarily in the services space, yeah. upgraded them from a services company to a software company and then sold it recently for a billion dollars. And prior to Galvanize, you were SVP at Sage and VP at Intuit and a very illustrious career over 25 years transforming companies, brands, business models, and marketplaces. How are you today, Lori? Well, I am so glad to be here. I, I've never quite thought of myself as a, a, the Navy. So this is new skin for me. <laughs> I kind of like to think of myself as half pirate, half Navy, but uh, really glad to be here. Thanks, Lloyd. I, I think the attire also makes sense, right? I'm like des dressed like a pirate and <laughs> you're uh, dressed very well. Like uh, there's a, we're at a ball, so that's great. You're looking <laughs> fantastic. To kick things off, Lori would love to get more about your background, how you got to galvanize, how you transformed the company. Why don't I screen share? And yeah. I'll take maybe 10 minutes just to warm things up and then we can dive into the, the good stuff. We officially uh, closed our transaction with Diligent uh, on April 6th. And so okay. you're getting me in a very, very incredible moment here. Uh, and as uh, Lloyd mentioned there, um, we uh, have been known up until recently as ACL. And uh, we were actually born in the University of British Columbia school system back in 1972 before most of you were born. And uh, what you see here is Professor Hartwell. He's this uh, champion who uh, built an, uh, an algorithm with a handful of students back in 1972 and basically gave that capability away to uh, professors and auditors around the world uh, for the better part of a decade and, and change. And uh, what it allowed people to do was interrogate data for anomalies, which could be indicative of fraud, corruption, and waste, and thus uh, audit command language was born. This is his son, Harold. Uh, Harold commercialized the business in 1987, and perhaps it's just worth emphasizing right here, um, I was not the, uh, the founder, like many of you. Uh, I did not start up this business. You can see our milestone wall here with many, many, many um, accolades over, over the decades. I restarted the business, however, uh, when I joined in 2011. And, uh, you know, despite building a category and growing it to a global footprint, we kind of flatlined by 2011 and falling victim maybe to our, our own historical success. And I joined Galvanize on the invitation to break all of the rules that uh, Hart and Harold had created in the first place. And um, if any of you have been through a CEO founder transition, that is something that you have to do delicately. The, the, you know, the founder may want you to break all the rules, but when you start doing that, you, know, you have to have really good chemistry and alignment and, and strong communications. We'll talk about this uh, more, but uh, you know, one, one thing I had to do early uh, was create belief. It, it's ironic. Our mission at the time I joined almost 10 years ago was to be the most trusted billion dollar software company. And nobody in our organization believed it. Um, we, 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 we'd run out of gas, uh, employees didn't feel like they'd authored that goal line and, uh, didn't feel like we were making the appropriate investments to get there. And a, a fundamental part of my role was to recreate belief. And, uh, indeed we, we would say leaders create a future that otherwise would not have happened by embracing what they don't know, making promises they don't know how to keep and then living up to their word. And I know that many of you do that all day long. Um, but we had to relearn how to do that uh, after several decades of leadership. Um, and uh, when I was hired, it was really with an emphasis to start with culture and then to leverage culture to transform many other elements of our business. We're very uh, symbolic and uh, culture is a really big deal at Galvanize. And I'll just kind of maybe animate this screen out. Uh, this, this is basically my journey. Um, I've been here nine and a half years. And uh, what you see are annualized billings, revenue, and profit. And uh, as as Lloyd mentioned there, um, you know we were fairly heavy consulting when I joined. Forty seven percent of our revenues, we were perpetual. Um, we were on premise. And uh, if you can look at the first five years there, you know you could say I didn't do a very good job, and we were still pretty flat. But what we were doing was um, 
giving this business a, a seven organ transplant. Uh, we were fundamentally reshaping the quality of the revenues, transitioning our technology, our business model, uh, and our value proposition. So again, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but our, our, our formula, and I almost hate to call it a playbook, but looking back, you know, our playbook over time, is we started with culture, we, um, we bought a true multi-tenant cloud uh, solution early on and reversed our entire business around that. We um, were a subscription model, which was a very big part of our, our transformation. We took on investment from Norwest the first time in our bootstrapped history in 2017. And uh, with them as an excellent partner, we rebranded our business from ACL to Galvanize. Uh, we got um, even better at acquisitions. And uh, you know, through all of those changes, we uh, created a lot of resiliency uh, through COVID while actually becoming the recognized leader in our space. And I'll show you a slide on that in a second. Um, as many of you I know are, are focused on uh, global go-to-market capability is, is a, a big part of the formula here. And uh, being in 130 countries takes a lot of tenacity. Um, and so that, that remains a preoccupation for us as we had looked to uh, further double our business in the next three year, years, just before we got acquired by Diligent. So just a few other things here. Um, you know, some of us joke internally that if you had to have a one page resume from the uh, galvanized kind of uh, journey, this would be it. Um, in 2011, we weren't known at all in the governance, risk and compliance space. And, and you can see uh, the Forrester wave recognizing us at kind of the top corner. And that, that felt damn good, I'm not gonna lie but it was based on a, a lot of uh, hard work and in, in kind of that transformation playbook that I shared with you uh, earlier. And so, you know, we, um, we've always been very overt about wanting to go public and not getting sold. And uh, ironically, here I am uh, on, the, on the tail of a, a billion dollar US acquisition. Uh, COVID um, was unexpected for all of us, but in particular, the amount of inbound with, you know, a lot of investment dollars available and a scarcity of assets. And uh, hopefully we'll talk about this Lloyd, but because of the um, investment in relationships that we placed with, with bankers and PE and strategics alike over that entire journey, we were able to queue up a lot of choice and had a lot of inbound uh, interest in 2020. And if I could you know, maybe summarize on one slide, things that were really effective for us to, to achieving that outcome. Um, we had a one page strategic plan, single most important piece of paper, a galvanized captures our vision, values, mission. Um, it's the orientation for board through frontline alike. We had a billion dollar heat map. Um, if you're a data junkie, certainly it seems kind of a Navy thing to do. Uh, I love the billion dollar heat map. Um, we're very visible about that. And we got better and better and better at storytelling. And, and we told the story our way. Uh, in fact, uh, we use that as a bit of a screen. Um, if people didn't wanna hear it our way, if they didn't buy into our culture, then they weren't the best partners for us. And uh, maybe lastly, just we, we, we picked up the uh, momentum around who we were talking to. Uh, we had open dialogues with investment bankers, private equity and strategics alike, uh, really with the mantra of, of creating choice. Um, you know, six months ago, I, I would have thought that we would have done an additional raise and really to fuel additional acquisitions. I would not have imagined that we sold to a strategic, um, but in the end we did. Um, Diligent is an amazing organization. It owns the board governance space. And, uh, you know, if, if you know anything about risk professionals like auditors, they don't necessarily have the audience that they should to, uh, to the boardroom. And uh, thus our customers now have access to 700,000 iPads of the world's most influential uh, board directors and leaders. And so, you know, maybe just to, by way of a, a quick wrap, uh, if you haven't figured it out, um, I'm, I'm Canadian. We're a Canadian headquartered business, though sold in 130 countries. And um, we're really proud of this outcome. Um, we, we had to work our ass off to um, create belief again. And uh, it's a, a goal line, um, you know, that that I, I'm so I have so much gratitude to share uh, to share with employees. Um, this transaction makes us one of only 20 unicorns in Canada, first led by a female. And uh, you know, as a as a byproduct, you know, I hope that we've we've um, bred kind of the next generation of uh, of startup entrepreneurs in into our economy. So hopefully that was uh, good for a, a warm up there, Lloyd.
that was fantastic and and so inspiring there's so many unicorns in canada maybe 5 years ago they weren't as much as many mm -hmm. but the first female led unicorn in canada now there's cloudflare which is co-founded by a canadian but that's a us company but i want to dive in to a few things that you talked about here that that's going to be great but the but the starting point for this was you know early stage startups often act like pirates right like we're doing whatever we can to to scale in pursuit of the treasure and you know we're rough around the edges we break things along the way but it comes a time where you know you got to turn into this navy right and and as a founder you're you're sort of battling with yourself oh i don't want to do that i don't want to raise money i'm going to have to add all these grown ups to the company but being disciplined and polished in your approach with a long term strategic view towards market domination is the only way to build a massive company you can't be a pirate forever like look at what happened uh with uber there right eventually they swapped the the leader because ultimately you know if you're a pirate forever all you're going to get is loot but navies <laughs> their worlds right and and, and so i want to i want to start by saying as a founder transition let's start there what yeah. does it take for a founder to transition to scale i mean do founders have to think about like ah oh, you know what I don't think I can graduate into that and I don't want to add executives to my team. I'm just going to sell the company, but it doesn't have to be that way. But talk about founder transition and how it worked at Galvanize uh, either leveling up or bringing someone from the outside. Well, I I just it's interesting to open this question this way, right? Um so many uh so many tech CEOs and founders sell out before they have to and I think we're probably a bit more unique. Uh, in fact, when I joined, there was bets all over town. There was bets in the building. How long before I get fired or I got quit? Because mostly when a, a founder CEO invites someone like me to the table to break all the rules, um, they don't really want you to break the rules. And uh, Harold uh, Will was unique. Um, he had uh, a lot of self-awareness and um, he wanted to continue to be part of uh, this this amazing um, uh, business and move to the board. And, uh, you know, he and I worked really, really hard to build chemistry. Um, we made sure that we had alignment and values and in destination. And, uh, you know, in his own words, you know, I've asked him, you know, if you were to recommend to other founders, you know, how to ready yourself for this and how to do a founder CEO transition effectively. He, he's, he says this, know yourself, be up for it choose very carefully. Uh, I, I was one of 127 people interviewed and uh, I think I had 14 interviews myself. I, that's, that was a big effort. 100% commit, be prepared to put everything at risk and then get the hell out of the way. And uh, because he did that and you know, because we built chemistry around kind of a common set of values, we've had this outcome. And what were some challenges you saw during that time in transitioning? Was there any friction um, were there some interesting stories? Were, were there like, I guess, employee activism, shareholder activism? Uh, yeah, well, there is a lot of skepticism. And I remember describing the organization kind of like a ping pong game. I don't know why I described it that way, but there's like a third of employees that were like ready to go. Well, like we can do more. And there was a third of employees that were kind of burnt and maybe negative influencers. And then there's a third of employees that were in the middle watching the ping pong match going on, figuring out, well, what side am I going to be on? And it was really, really critical that uh, I got in fast and I talked to employees and it's so obvious, it's not even complicated, but um, town halls is a mainstream part of our culture. And uh, my first two weeks, I did 14 town halls, no pink slip, let's just talk about what's working, what's not working. And I learned in my first three minutes in my very first town hall from employees what needed to change. We had to, to change leadership. We had to have a real roadmap and make some investments there. Um, but more importantly, I actually was able to spot in a crowd who the change agents were. These were people that had integrity of intent, who could create belief, who had the respect of their peers. And those are the folks that I put in charge of our transformation. I didn't care how long they'd been there. I didn't care what function they were in. I, I was interested in kind of the caliber of their character and their ability to move a room. And uh, it, it, it was an essential change for us. It broke all of the ice because I listened to people and I put them in charge of their own ideas, basic stuff. And, and what were your top two or three things to identify who those change agents were? I have this fundamental belief that there is high leverage people or, or high trajectory people where 
if if you attach to them, they go from like zero to ten, and they're high experience people, right? And sometimes people with lots of experience they don't want to change. So oh. how do you identify that, right? Especially going from a services business to now transforming to a software because likely if you stayed services, you couldn't have got this multiple. But how did you spot like who is the right person there? I mean, you know, there's hundreds of people in your company. Boy, it's like, I mean, you're making me think if did I have like more newer people or, or more tenured people? I, I, I guess I was looking for people that were brave, regardless of tenure or regardless of function and people that, I mean, to, to on jar us from where we are, we needed bravery. And for people to stand up in a room in front of me, you know, in that first few weeks and actually just put themselves out there. Those are the folks I watched. And perhaps there's a bit of a bias towards extroverts. You know, there's many other ways that you can get a voice of opinion. And, and we're, you know, I think we're pretty good at engaging our introverts as well. But when you get folks in a small setting and you make it comfortable for them to have a, you know, a voice, you got to pick the ones that got a voice early. And uh, then you've got to clear all of the all of the, the antibodies out of the way. I mean, one of the first things that we had to do was fix our roadmap. And I remember through all my town halls, we spotted about six people and we created a little SWAT team and I put them in a room, locked them up for like three months, threw some meat in there every now and then. And then, you know, said, you guys are in charge. You come out with the, the new roadmap. And I remember the founder and I talking about it. He's like, what? Like, how can we do that? How can we just have like these six people come out of the room with our, our roadmap? It's going to be wrong. And I said, yeah, but that, that's okay. I mean, it's not going to be perfect. The point is who's authoring it. And again, it's all about creating belief. I mean, so often in larger organizations, you know, decisions start moving to the top and uh, man, if you can invigorate opinion and put people in charge, you know, as close as possible to the front line, I mean, you build momentum. That That is fundamentally the recipe for how we change things. So Maxine asks here, during that time in the early process, what were your biggest stresses and can you screw up something that's destined to grow and scale? Oh man, there were so many times you know, we could have screwed things up. I mean, when we made big changes, like we changed our business model to subscription in one year in uh, 2014, crazy. I mean, if I'd done it before, I might not have done it again because now I know how hard it was to do something like that. But you know, when you when you have a hard change, you know, it's good to have an emergency escape clause and you know play that game of chicken as long as you as as possible. Um, my 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 challenges in my first six months would have been actually more just senior leadership team obstacles. You know, I, I broke down sil silos. Um, you know, we were very fractured and there was, you know, politics and agendas. So I just got all that stuff out of the way. Um, and, you know, maybe with the founder and I, it was about just massively communicating and, uh, you know, cause it was, I really respect what he did. I mean, um, he pretty much let me come in and blow everything up. And, you know, there's a couple of moments in our relationship early where he's like, we need more information. We need more information. I was like, there's no more information. I mean, we have to take the best of what we've got, put the best people on it and go from, you know, our experience and our instincts, but there's no more information. And I mean, I don't need to say that to this crowd, right? But yep. just trying to get the organization to rebuild the muscle that it had somewhere back, you know, close to 1972, which is just to go for it. You know, we had to actually relearn how to become pirates before we be could become the Navy again. That's amazing. That's what I was thinking as you went through this. And, and as you transformed this business model from services to software, is that why the founder brought you in? You transformed the company from services to software or what was your thinking and why did you join the company? Um, my, my, the ask of me was actually to, to uh, focus on culture initially. And, uh, you know, I'd worked at, at Intuit and Sage um, before for five and seven years respectively. And I'd learned revenue and customer with Intuit and I'd learned EBITDA and consolidation and kind of global partner model with, with Sage. But never in a privately held business with this kind of global footprint and with the ask to fix culture. And, uh, you know, I'm a very value centric leader and to be given the opportunity to lead a financial and a, a customer transformation with an emphasis on culture. 
I mean, that that was just something that that really resonated, uh, really resonated with me. Definitely. And um, in, in this transformation of business model, because I want to dive in there, what were the first few things you did, like moving from services to software? Like how you, you shifted the thinking, you identify five or six people. And yes, you needed to become a pirate to become the Navy again, because it's like you came into an established services company, blew it up and uh, and build a startup. What were the first two or three steps you did to make that transformation? Well, we had, uh, so we were, were a software company that had 47% uh, of our revenues were services. So it was a perpetual uh, on-premise um, technology and business model. Uh, first thing I had to do was uh, address culture and uh, move out leadership obstacles and create an environment where it was kind of like stepping on an anthill where all of the ants were like out of their little tunnels and, you know, which create this like reinvigoration where ideas were were almost like, you know, expected. So we had to focus on culture. We acquired a cloud-based, true multi-tenant cloud-based technology uh, three months into my job. And I had to protect that like crazy. The antibodies were ready to pounce down on it. And, you know, I had to you know, make sure that it, its CEO at the time was a direct leader to me. And I gave it disproportional uh, attention and um, uh, I just created space for it. Um, and so with culture and with technology, we were able to work our, our value proposition. Um, I did, I had to motivate people to sell cloud. And, uh, you know, we, we back in the olden days of 2011, auditors and risk professionals, they didn't do cloud. And so I get all kinds of pushback, you know, we, we, we don't, auditors don't buy cloud. I, I can't sell that. It's like, well, can you sell it if I pay you 35% commission? And they're like, yeah, no problem. We can do that. And so compensation, you know, I might sign sound plain Jane, but when you're trying to make major changes that are against every, you know, bone in someone's body, you have to reward that behavior, right? You have to disproportionately pay for the behavior that you want. And so we had culture, technology, customer value prop, and uh, compensation all in play. And uh, that positioned us to ask our customers to change a business model, which we did bootstrapped in one year. Um, and, and, and the byproduct of that, by the way, was we turned our P&L upside down for three years. So, you know, the first year we converted everybody in 130 countries to subscription. We're like, hooray, we did it. And then the second year, like, holy shit, like we did this. And uh, we don't know actually how to count our money now because everything was deferred and we had to hang out in our balance sheet and uh, we had to focus really on customers consumption of our gear as evidence that things were working and then you know we came out the tail end of that two and a half years later and you know with the compound forward benefit of a subscription model oh my gosh like growth started rolling in it was so gratifying it was so gratifying I can I can imagine, and that's what got you your multiple. I don't know if if you might, if you're open to sharing this, but when you raised the money with Norwest, um, what were you guys at revenue wise, and and now you sold obviously, or you don't have to share that if it's not public. I I won't share that if you don't mind, but uh, you know we were um, you know let's call it at least half the size we were today, and multiples then. Um, not, you know, multiples in general in the market were also lower than they were today, but, you know, we, we didn't have, we were just on the tail end of our business model conversion, um, at least half the size then. And so our, our attractiveness continued to grow after Norwest came on as, uh, as you saw from my slide there, there was other things that we did that, that added extra fuel. Um, we rebranded our company. Um, I'm not sure if anyone on this call even knows ACL, but if you're in the auditor space or the risk space, that's like a household name. And um, it was another big risk we took. And, uh, you know, actually it was at the invitation of our customers because um, we were so pigeonholed in audit, which is just a fraction of our total addressable market that we had to unleash ourselves by changing our brand so that, you know, the market would give us permission to sell to, you know, the cybersecurity people and and uh, the general counsel and and all of those uh, folks that, that own the risk agenda as well. I want to go into this change engines concept here you talked mm -hmm. about. Uh, tell me about town halls that you've done to engage your people and give them the authorship of the destination. So we do town halls all the time. Um, and uh, we did them a lot at the beginning. And uh, it's just a way when you join to create a lot of credibility and frankly to learn. Learn what is broken, learn what's not broken and learn who wants to lead the change. Um, 
I'll, I'll, I'll add, uh, we, I did something in my second year there. I, I asked a bunch of CEOs, like, have you ever had a, a public top talent program? Everybody's like, nobody does that. You know, and, and at the time I estimated maybe 25% of companies have a top talent program um, and hardly any of them are public with them. So when I joined, we had actually a top talent program, but it was viewed very suspiciously by employees because it, everybody knew there was one and nobody knew who was on it exactly unless you weren't on it. And it, it just fueled a lot of mistrust of management. And so change agents, as we actually call our top talent program, are about spotting those folks that, you know, looking back have had strong performance, but looking forward have strong potential because again, it's something about their persona, their ability to lead their peers, their appetite for taking, you know, constructive risks. So they've got this potential. And so each year we actually publish about uh, somewhere between five to 10% of our employees who are change agents. We actually write a paragraph around here's why they're change agents. And they're given uh, equity, they're given access to me. Um, I do personal development plans with them. We do like strategic workshops and stuff like that. And well, why wouldn't you wanna tell the organization who the change agents are? I mean, better named change agent than top talent because there's a bit of a, maybe a, a, an elitist uh, label to top talent. But this has become a big deal in our organization because it allows me to describe and show publicly what we're after and it also allows me to um, get to know these people and, and in fact if i may say it around the question of scale uh we're 500 employees um it's hard to know every single thing about 500 employees but i sure as hell better know a lot about the change agents uh, you know, what motivates them professionally, you know, what's meaningful for them and, you know, what do they want to be when they grow up? And that's been an incredible part of the change agent program is it keeps it personal and it keeps me accountable to knowing who our, our key talent is. And it puts me in a position with their help of saying, hey, if you want to be in this job two years from now, you know, how do we create a path for you there? How can we create some experiential, you know, um, opportunity for you so that you can get that role. Now, that, that actually was a, a huge, huge part of our transformation. How often do you do your town halls? Once a month. There are some people like, you know, who come with a lot of experience, but likely they're not super high trajectory. You need both in a company, right? When I say that, yeah. meaning they won't likely, they're, they're great at doing the things at hand. And there are folks who can transform those things for a bigger, better future. Mm -hmm. And how, how do you, promote people who are, don't come with high experience, but you spot them as change agents without screwing up the culture and creating bad will, right? Like there are change agents, sometimes they're very, very vocal, right? They, they, they want their voices heard, they say a lot. I guess, how do you differentiate if that's a toxic person versus a change agent? Because these people are vocal, they wanna be heard, and you know they're high trajectory people I've found are restless. So they just wanna be heard. High experienced people who are, you know, they're great at what they do, but they're just, you know, they don't want to rock the boat. So how do you, how do you, how do you differentiate that? And how do you make sure you're promoting people without messing up the culture, right? You're saying you're giving these people a little more equity. Um, you're giving them involvement and likely many of them are new or, or newer than people who've been there and done that the old way. First of all, I think it's really cool when you find somebody new that you can put in this crowd. Because that means you don't have to be, you know, in the geriatrics ward before you get into the change agent club. So, you know, there's no bias towards brand new or tenured. Um, and you know what? We didn't always get it right. Yeah, we we did put every now and then in the change agent program folks that, you know, maybe spoke more than they acted. And then they're just not in the change agent program next year. I mean, it's, you know, all that's, a, that's, that's, a you know, probably a fairly predictable outcome. I mean, what's more important is 90% of the change agents aren't toxic. And they, uh, you know, as I said, there's five to 10% of our organization are change agents. When, you know, when they leave a strategy meeting, they're carrying the conversation forward into their group, including, you know, how to manage a conversation when there's somebody that's maybe disruptive in the crowd. I mean, that's a good skill set to, uh, to, to gain as well. Coming back here to this one-page strategic plan that you talked about in your mm -hmm. slides, mm -hmm. tell us more about that and how did you 
enforce it? Do you still use it? Does each product team, each division have it? Walk us through what the ingredients of that one page strategic plan and how that sort of uh, formulates your destiny. Single most important piece of paper that galvanize. Um, if I'm ever CEO somewhere else or you know in any board role I have, I will always try to influence that organization having a one page strat plan, perhaps post AI. Um, it, uh, it, it's, it, it's this tool to um, corral the emotion and the intellect of a large group of people, frontline, C-suite, uh, everywhere in the middle and the board. Um, I use it at every presentation I do. It has our vision, our mission, our values. And uh, it's, it also captures our top three strategic priorities for any given year. And those, um, you know, when you double click, they, they change each year, of course, but thematically in order, very purposely mobilized talents, uh, customer experience, and then uh, business model would be kind of the three anchors. So we're very, very vocal around the order of transformation, starting with employee. If you've got amazing employees, you're gonna have them, you know, an awesome customer experience and you've got both of those the financial outcome will, 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 will come around. And uh, too often when CEOs join to restart up an organization, you know, they, they do the easiest thing, which is a financial re-engineer. But in my opinion, that's not a pervasive thing. Um, if you could get culture and customer experience right first, you're going to have the financial outcome. Talk about building a moat because, you know, we've had a few conversations so far prior to this and mm -hmm. you, bring up moat a lot. What goes into building the moat? What's a strong moat and how did you guys build that? Well, we're, we're top corner there on that uh, Forrester wave. And um, we talk about moat a lot. Like what is that distinguished, dis, dis, uh, you know, that distinct competitive advantage you have? And you have to keep, I mean, everything has an expiry date, right? So you can't uh, rest on your laurels. But for us, by way of example, um, we're the only true multi-tenant uh, platform, not point solution in our governance, risk and compliance category that has uh, native data automation and a global footprint. Um, and, and that may sound like blah, 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 but uh, you know, under the hood, that's real stuff. That is stuff that our competitors cannot easily match. And we're very careful about trying to kind of protect and expand our lead. You know, in, in some cases it's through additional R and D investment. Maybe it's through expanding our partner model maybe it's through acquisition. But uh, every organization, in my opinion, should have a really, really clear moat. It's an obvious thing, but uh, I've met a lot of organizations that aren't really that clear. What, what in your opinion are like, I guess if you had to prioritize like the top three things to make up a great moat, what would they be? Man, it's hard to pick one thing, but what makes us hard to catch is you know, there's many competitors in our space that uh, are strong, but they're North American local. It's not easy to do business in 130 countries. And if you think about it, you know, a lot of customers, you know, Johnson & Johnson might be an example of an organization. They have a global operation. So their ability to access our resources on a global scale is an example of how global scale contributes to our mode. It's not just the business we do in a specific country, but it's how we can service global customers. Um, True multi-tenant cloud. I, you know, I, I, I'm not sure of kind of the backdrop of all the folks on this call here, but I met so many companies as we're looking to acquire, where they're single tenant or they're a hybrid, we're single tenant hosted and on-prem. Like we just walked away from all of that stuff. It doesn't scale. Um, it's tempting when you're trying to incubate, you know, kind of a billion-dollar uh, outcome to say, well, what if we just modify our technology and we'll we'll scoop in that little on-prem because it's a big government client and, you know. Uh, we didn't compromise. We, when we introduced cloud, true multi-tenant cloud to our category 10 years ago, we walked away from a lot of business and pioneered uh, you know, a, a cloud only outcome. And that gave us a tailwind. That's hard for a lot of our customers to, our, our competitors to recreate right now because they've chosen the wrong technology, they're on the wrong business model and they're all hitting the wall at kind of somewhere between 10 and $15 million because they can't scale. Maxine is doing a recap here. She says, don't, <laughs> don't be afraid to walk away from the business and what makes us hard to catch. Love that. It's I, awesome. I want to make a comment there. If you don't mind, I saw Maxine's comment and it's something I wanted to say. Cause I, I look back, you know, nine and a half years I've been here, billion dollar valuation. Um, 
what could I've done faster? And, uh, you know, I hate to call it a playbook, but you know, we kind of have a playbook. We culture, technology, business model, rebrand, M&A, and kind of global go-to-market. Those are things you need to do to, to be able to end succession. Um, but here's one thing that added a couple of years, at least to my journey, is I had to unwind stuff. I had to exit countries. I had to exit technologies. I had to exit opportunistic revenue lines, like training, for example, would have been an example of ours, where I like, dial them down. And, uh, you know, I just thought that might be meaningful to throw to this group because, you know, when you're in maybe an earlier phase of your business, it's tempting, maybe sometimes even essential to take that non-strategic revenue uh, line or even non-strategic customer. But I, I can tell you it added two, three years for us to unwind that after the fact. So, you said the second most important piece of paper is your TAM. Yeah. Tell us more about that. How should companies calculate their TAM? How should they think about it? Yeah. Right. yeah. I probably shouldn't say this, but in a previous job, I had uh, a CEO say, what's your TAM? What's your TAM? I'm like, it's like, oh, like that's just like an academic exercise. Oh, okay, I'll go and I'll figure out how big. It's like the billions of dollars. Um, our TAM was our second most important piece of paper. And especially as, you know, we not only pitched to bankers and, and PE and even strategic alike, because we had a very original um, form of TAM um, presentation, but it also helped us um, organize our R&D investment versus our m and strategy. And so what we um, have sized for our governance risk and compliance category is a $41 billion TAM. And just for laughs, you know, when I joined, we we're kind of pigeonholed into kind of the audit management auditor segment, which is a billion out of 41 billion. I mean, if that's not an obvious catalyst for expanding buyers and moving beyond audit, then I don't know what is, but we had a very methodical, um, mathematical um, understanding of how big different geographies were, how big different buyers were, and how big different, um, we call them use cases, different types of risks were in overlap. And that we also scored our capability on those intercepts, kind of using a ski run metaphor, actually. Green run, we kick, uh, you know, blues we're not bad at, black runs we're not great at. And we actually managed our pipeline against that, that metaphor, meaning we didn't want our sales guys with a bunch of black diamonds, you know, sucking resources out of the whole organization just to sell a deal. So, you know, we were very purposeful around um, what segments of the market that we pointed our resources. So our TAM view um, informed uh, our build versus buy. Uh, our R&D organization is pointed at um, continuing to um, uh, evolve our platform to expand our TAM. And in some cases, uh, we actually bought our way into the TAM. We made in our acquisition of a company called RSAM in 2019, for example, that bought us kind of vendor risk management and uh, cyber risk management, things that would have was faster to build than to buy. And that town, by the way, it's with the one page strap plan, it's in almost every single deck. I love it. There's a bunch of questions here asking for that one page strat plan uh, template. So I might ping you, ping you for that and we'll add it to the recap. But when it comes to TAM, at, at, you know, when, when companies are early, they're often focused on their immediate target market, right? You got the total addressable market and then you got the immediate mm -hmm. target market. At what point do you say now, you know, I'm going to expand more and more into the TAM? Is that at like 1 million revenue, 10 million revenue? At what point do you say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to all my messaging to investors internally, everything else is going to be saying, let's chase this TAM. Because in the early days, if you're you know, talking about a massive target market, people might, you know, just uh, sort of shun you, right? Thinking that, hey, this, this person is a dreamer. And when you ask that question, are you thinking about it geographically? I kind of sense you're thinking geographically, but are you thinking- uh, it, could be, it could be overall market, right? It could be like, say, let's say, you know, Boast, for example, we automate R&D tax credits for US and Canadian companies. Mm -hmm. Globally, trillions of dollars are given in all business tax credits, and we can chase after the global market to automate all tax credits. But if we said that like a few years ago, people would think like these guys are <laughs> these guys are dreamers, right? Um, both internally and externally, likely. So, at, at what point do you you know do people start like taking you seriously, or you should take that big tam very seriously? You know, clearly, prioritization is an art, and. Uh... 
you kind of got to, I'll use the monopoly metaphor. I mean, you got to nail home base to give yourself permission to uh, experiment, right? And uh, picking the experiments wisely, um, you know, we would have debates around, you know, do we accelerate our platform development would be a, a clear example. Do we build our way or buy our way? Um, but we'd have a lot of discussions around geogra geography. And, um, you know, things that we would consider is, um, it's not just the cost of getting there, but it's the um, kind of the revenue side, it's supply and demand in a way. So we would often um, referee TAM expansion based on, well, how, let's say, for example, uh, we want to move into a new GRC risk case or to a different buyer or even geography. What's the history of churn in those markets? What's the average revenue per customer? Like, you know, is it going to be a meaningful size? Um, and so, you know, sometimes I think maybe that gets a little bit lost. It's a little bit of a separation of the kernel from the chaff, but if you chase too many small things and you're not gonna have enough room in the jar for the big things. And so I think that the trick is to, um, you know, maybe I'll just make this up, like put 80% of your next investment in something that's big don't put it in 80 small things, you know what I mean? Because those things add up to exhaustion. And, uh, you know, as we looked at, for example, taking certain geographies direct, I mean, those are big investments. You can't just like kind of penny your way in. Um, to go direct in, let's say market like the UK for us, I mean, we had to have a full contingent, a brigade, we used to call them actually. You know, we had to have this certain minimum number of, uh, we had SDRs and sales and we had pre-sales, we need consultants. Like what's the bare minimum product management to actually land in a market in an authentic, legit, legitimate way? <laughs> have to get home base, right? Because if you don't, you don't pass go and you don't collect $200. And then, you know, if you're able to carve off investment for your next TAM expansion, you know, make it a big one, not a bunch of small ones. So from, from the time you took on, it took you nine and a half years to drive Galvanize to a 1 billion USD valuation. And, and you made this decision to take the uh, exit over going IPO. Why did you make that call? Because you know it's a massive TAM like you outlined and you guys are a market leader. I didn't expect this outcome. Um, and as you saw from that one slide, you know we, we especially last year, we're actively talking to investment bankers, AKA keep us, keep us uh, honest around um, uh, the, the time frame and you know, the probability of IPO. And so we had a lot of excellent conversations there. That's the path I thought we were on. And of course we had uh, a ton of PE and uh, we would have considered a fairly large raise, our next raise uh, to drive acquisition. Um, and we had very, very few strategics. So ironic here that we sold to a strategic and, you know, I'll say the ultimate responsibility, I believe, of a, a CEO is to make the right decision for a customer. And as I said, um, this is category redefining to bring, you know, our $41 billion GRC TAM into kind of the board portal space and to marry the impact a risk professional have can have with the responsibility a board director has, it, it was just not something we could say no to. It was above all uh, other choices, the best thing to do for, for, our, um, for our customers. That's and I mean, maybe as a, a side note here, and, and true of all of us, um, you know, our category is consolidating. And, uh, you know, for many of the years I've been here, a company like mine could look down and maybe scoop up a point solution and be acquisitive you know, call it mid-size on small or call it big on medium. That game's changing in our category, at least. It's kind of mid-size on mid-size or large on large consolidation. And I, I think from, um, you know, from a competitive positioning, it was really essential that we did this. Makes sense. There's a question here that asks, could you tell us more about how you leverage partnerships to drive growth? We are pretty focused on a direct model in core strategic geographies and an indirect model in ones that we don't ever intend to, could never be good at uh, being direct, a market like Africa, for example. And so, I mean, that for us, at least, that has kind of built some clarity around kind of our hybrid strategy. It's been kind of a geographical uh, line in the sand. And back to my earlier point, like when we go direct in a, a region, it's, it's like with a big commitment. I mean, it's not a small team 
in order to make make that um, make that play. I'd say we could probably do a better job in terms of diversifying the kind of partners that we have. You know, uh, building marketplace and and looking for uh, you know a lot, looking to uh, diversify the kind of uh, partner um, base that we have today. And so that's uh, that's a that's a forward opportunity. Definitely. Now, I want to go through this one billion dollar heat map. Um, and and as you were planning to build this one billion dollar software company, that is, you know, your mission was to be the most trusted one billion dollar software company that nobody believed in, I guess. But who were the key hires, and what points you brought them along the way? Answering that in context of the heat map, you took over. Like, at what point do you hire maybe a CMO or CRO or COO or CFO? Like all these people. Because you inherited a, a forty-year-old company that had a different DNA, you changed the DNA, yeah. and to, to transform it into a one billion-dollar software company, probably needed some very key execs. I mean, we talked about yeah. sort of change agents from within. Yeah. But who are the external people you brought? Well, we all go through these phases, right? You know, and probably have our own different opinions on what what are the different kind of revenue lines. You know somebody might be good at leading a function or a business up to let's say 10 million and maybe somebody's great from 10 to 25 and maybe somebody's great from 25 to 100 and you know it it's normal for individuals to have a, a unique wall and i think the responsibility of a leader is to be able to um anticipate that and um you know when i joined i actually replaced the entire leadership team except for one um, because at that point stage, we needed just the new DNA. We, we had to do that, frankly. And it wasn't just about experience. It was about culture. And then through time, um, kind of the bar goes up on different functions. And sometimes you get lucky in that you have somebody that's born internally that incubates into like your next CTO. That's the best outcome. But uh, I do think it's important to bring in external along the way. I'll, I'll say this, just a couple of key hires come to mind just as a point of reference. Um, when we brought on uh, chief revenue officer from Avalara, I worked with him actually at Sage and, you know, he joined Avalara when they were 10 million and, you know, uh, brought them through their IPO at, you know, they're north of 500 million today. So that's pretty good experience to have, obviously, as we head into an IPO or so we thought. Um, so having a uh, scaling chief revenue officer at some point is critical. And that's hard. That's culture, you know, that just creates a lot of culture tension because uh, it's easy for everybody to be an expert in sales and in marketing and uh, to bring mathematical rigor, you know, that's tough because it's a tough job. And um, so, you know, that's, that's something as you go through a hundred million dollar line uh, for sure. Um, I would recommend. Now, here's another one. And in fact, the person that helped me with the billion dollar heat map was actually an independent on my board. Somebody that's from our category who was the CEO and an executive chair and a founder and now a very successful investor. And, um, you know, for those folks here that don't have a board, you should seriously consider getting one because, uh, man, you, you, they, they'll hold you accountable, they'll bring discipline but they're going to bring a lot of experience, obviously, depending on how well you pick them. And uh, those those are two functions, our chief revenue officer and this independent that, you know, in my last few years had a, a really big impact on our outcome. This is great advice here. You know, sometimes you feel like you're drinking from a fire hose, but you want to just keep drinking anyway. And then I'm learning a ton, right? A lot of people don't want boards, but they add a lot of value. And you are the collective of everyone around you, right? You're the sum of the five, six people around mm -hmm. you. I want to go back to that CRO. What is the job of a CRO? What is the function of that person? Like, how, what are what does this person do? Because you mentioned my board and my CRO were critical to that one billion. To grow the business without breaking culture, <laughs> maybe that's pretty oversimplified. Our CRO has our um, direct business, in, including both new sales and renewal, um, has marketing and uh, has partners. Um, and in other organizations, they would often have professional services as well. And, um, and he has operations, so pretty large scope. Um, not sure if others on this call have this uh, shared experience, but the one thing that's been a real eye-opener for me with, um, with, with this uh, gentleman coming on is, um, like I said, everybody, you know, having an opinion on sales is like a sport almost 
and uh, others kind of get a lot more relief. And so he's taken a real good poke at marketing and to make sure that our marketing organization is held kind of with the same level of accountability and has the same level of visibility. That's actually been a pretty pronounced um, emphasis for us as of late. So at least for us, I thought I'd share, that's where he's bringing a ton of value. Um, certainly the expansion of how we think about partners those are those are you know those are things that we're learning from him and it, you know if I may, um, having come from Avalara, I mean, they do an excellent job at at, at partners. The the term moat actually comes from my CRO here because, you know, in, in Avalara's case because they've they've you know they've got such kind of spaghetti code <laughs> into so many partners. I mean, how does anybody bump them? So partners done well can be obviously a very effective moat. And uh, he's an example of somebody that led that. I'm gonna summarize the 10 tips really quickly. We talked about founder transition. We talked about change agents, moats, the one page strategic plan. We talked about having your, your TAM, your playbook, which you talked about the six great things, which was culture, which was technology, business model, global GTM brand, and the M&A strategy. We talked about being focused and separating the kernel from the shaft. So going after the biggest opportunities versus ch chasing things that drag your averages down. We talked about your heat map with the two key functions there, your board, your CRO. The last thing here is courting investors, mm -hmm. and bankers, and strategics. Tell us about that. You guys raised 50 million, was it from Norwest? And was it only from Norwest? Um, we ultimately raised 70 from them in, uh, in a couple of uh, runs. And then, I mean, they were our, our one and only investor. And- uh, yeah. Was that a hindsight 2020? Would you have taken more investors or the one and done was probably the best decision? Due to headaches. They were great for us. I mean, we maybe are a bit unusual in that we we're bootstrapped for so many years. So it was, you know, something we wanted to be thoughtful about bringing in an investor. Um, that, that was a big change for the culture of our business, certainly the culture of our board. And we had an advisory board before Norwest joined. Um, but I'll say, uh, you know, one thing that we did all along, uh, and the founder did it before I got there, but we took the phone calls. And uh, far better to have relationships, you know, that you're far better not be in a sale, trying to be in a pitch position when you need the cash. It's far better to have the long standing relationships that are more chasing you than the other way around. And, and that's something, you know, I, I'll always try to recreate if I ever have the opportunity is taking the calls, being yourself, um, being clear on kind of your destination and making sure that there's alignment in that destination and, and, and culture. And, and we were able to, and they were able to date over the long term. And uh, it, it created a lot of choice for us in the end. And, and I'll just add, um, one thing we always did is we always told them what we were going to do. And then we did what we said. So, hey, we're gonna bring cloud to auditors or hey, you know, Harold, we're, I'm gonna transition to the, C, uh, the CEO role or hey, we're gonna convert our business model in one year or hey, we're gonna rebrand. And then we would meet these guys on the other side of doing that, they were, were amazed. And so we gain a lot of credibility over time. And um, I think it contributed to the 2020 kind of courtship that we had, because it wasn't starting from scratch. Awesome, that is, uh, that is phenomenal advice. Life and business is a marathon, it's not a sprint, right? It's not about the money in your bank account or the people around your tombstone. If you focus on relationships, they transcend companies. And um, you know, if you chase the relationship, you will build a long-term partnership. Oftentimes people ask me like, oh, should we optimize for the valuation? And I think if you optimize for the nth degree of valuation, the first time a massive roadblock hits, either you're out of there as a founder or the investors are not coming along for the, for the next round of funding to support you. So this is, this is great, this long-term relationship focused advice because um, they are intertwined with you and they know you personally kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Hello, one last question uh, here. Entering advice on entering new markets and when to build versus buy. Um, that was one. Maybe we can do that in rapid fire, like any any sort of rule of thumb for when to build versus buy, and how to think about profitability versus growth. Like, were you guys very profitable leading up to the acquisition, or just all growth focused? Uh, 
uh, rule of 40 or rule of 50 or whatever you want to do is managing uh, adding revenue growth with percent profit margin is probably most people on this know I, I really actually like that metric um, just know where you, just know what side of the line you're on and make sure that your c-suite and if you have it your board is aligned uh, every year as we went to uh, approval for our, our annual plan I would make sure we were all clear on, in fact, I would plant my whole leadership team by name and my board by name. Where are you on the scale of growth orientation versus EBITDA, one dimension, and strategic versus IPO, another dimension. And it's okay to have a difference of opinion. It's just not okay to not share your difference of opinion. And so the key thing for us was to be very, very clear on the relative tensions in the discussion. And, and for us, certainly the majority of us, we're, we're a very growth kind of uh, centric um, approach, um, but with respect, um, profitable. Not massively profitable, but we always wanted to have respectable profit. So, you know, kind of profitable growth was 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 our our uh, our goal. One follow up there, actually, at what point uh, does profitable growth matter? When you're at 10 million, should you be profitable? Should you be profitable at 50 million? Like when when should you sink it all in versus start taking some profits? I would referee it based on what infrastructure you have in place. So this may not be exactly what you're after, but if you've made the right choices with culture and business model and technology, and if you've got a path to global scale, then invest for growth. If you're on-prem and perpetual and you know have more of a body shop business, then invest for profit because it doesn't scale. That's, that's an awesome. You basically told me, Lloyd, don't reason with analogy <laughs> just because it works for somebody. doesn't work for you. Reason from first <laughs> If you have a path to scale, invest in growth. If you have a path to, if you don't have a path to scale and you're a body shop, then invest in uh, or, or focus on profitability. And then the, the last question here, build versus buy. Was there a rule of thumb that you looked at? Listen, one thing I want to say uh, on acquisitions, I, I'm a fan of acquisitions. Um, and when I first started and I, I combed the universe, I met, I met so many founders. Um, I actually have a better appreciation now, an M&A strategy, you know, a, a acquisition can be fed by multiple agendas. I started looking for product um, and we made a product acquisition the first three months and we made a product acquisition in 2019. Um, you can acquire geography. We acquired a channel partner in Asia. Um, that was a really good move. Um, you can acquire talent. Our design team was born of an acquisition and it's a fundamental part of our moat, by the way, we're beautiful beautiful to use. And uh, you can buy buyer type. I mean, that's our pre preoccupation right now is like, you know, what kind of organization owns, you know, the privacy agenda in our organization. So um, probably not really directing answering your question, but um, the build versus buy uh, discussion is not just one of R&D. It's, it's, as I've learned, it's also of talent, it's of geography. And it's a kind of go-to-market capability and brand. Awesome. Now, this has been fantastic. Uh, we're at the top of the hour here, three minutes over, actually. As you look back on your journey, what do you wish you did more of and what do you do, wish you did less of? I don't like to kind of look back and have regrets. Um, you know, there's things I, I didn't do that well uh, and mistakes I made. But, you know, as long as you reflect on those, you come out of it a better person. And so... I wouldn't change anything. I mean, even as I mentioned before, how could we have done this sooner? I mean, we had to unwind some stuff and, you know, maybe for us, this, this transaction happened at the exact right time. So I'll be my answer for now is, is uh, I wouldn't make any changes. Great things happen to great people. And you're one of the most wonderful people I've met. I've taken a lot of notes. I'm not, I'm, I'm actually not kidding here. I <laughs> But uh, last thing here before I let you go, what's the one company you're super excited about? One company? Yeah. Oh, come on. It's uh, Boast AI. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lori, for the plug. Have Thanks. a wonderful really, day. My Thanks. pleasure. I need some traction.